Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We are studying the book of Exodus and tonight we're headed for Exodus chapter 18. So I want to invite you to start finding a Bible and turning with me to Exodus chapter 18. We'll be there in just a few moments. If you have any questions, any concerns or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, if there's some way we can help you, we invite you to get in touch. Uh, send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you in that way. Well, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So the people have left Egypt following the 10 plagues. They have crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground. The Egyptian army has been destroyed. They have complained about the lack of food and water. God has miraculously provided both. And last week we saw the Israelites get attacked by the Amalekites. And as they are fighting, you may remember that Moses notices that when his hands are raised, the Israelites start to win, but when he lowers his hands, the Amalekites start to win. Well, his hands get tired, and so Aaron, his brother, and her, they actually hold up his hands until the Amalekites are defeated. So that's where we left off last week. That brings us to what comes next. So tonight we pick up with Exodus chapter 18, and the first paragraph is verses 1 through 4. Exodus chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for his, Israel, his people. Now the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife Zipporah after he had sent her away, and her two sons, of whom one was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. The other was named Eleazar, for he said, The God of my father was my help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Now, I don't know whether all of us remember this, but this is now, I believe, the third reference to Zipporah. The first reference came way back in Exodus chapter 2 when Moses arrives in Midian. You may remember how Moses helped water the flocks and Jethro gave him Zipporah, one of his daughters, almost as a kind of reward, maybe a, as a way of inviting him into the family. This is a man we want to keep. He's a hard worker and very conscientious, so we're going to marry him in. Well, the second reference to Zipporah comes in Exodus chapter 4. When Moses and Aaron head out for Egypt on this mission to confront Pharaoh, uh, Moses and Zipporah seem to get in a fight along the way. And in that argument, you may remember that Zipporah takes a knife and she cuts off her son's foreskin and she flings it at Moses' feet. That is how you know that an argument is getting pretty serious between a husband and a wife. And we're not explicitly told this, but it seems as if Moses and Zipporah actually separate at that point, with Moses and Aaron continuing on to Egypt, and Zipporah and the kids going back home to her dad. And again, we aren't told this, but we have no reference to Zipporah or the kids between that argument and what we find here in Exodus chapter 18. So there's this gap where Zipporah is missing. And obviously, confronting the most powerful man in the world, leading millions out of captivity into the wilderness, would have been a little bit more difficult with a wife and kids perhaps along for the ride. And so maybe it works out for the best. But back when we studied that argument in Exodus 4, I remember mentioning this reunion that was coming in Exodus chapter 18. And here we are. And so we are at it. So now when Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, hears about everything that God has done through Moses, Jethro packs up Zipporah and the kids and takes them on this journey to meet Moses out there in the wilderness. Now that things had calmed down a little bit, now that they are uh, over the, the serious issue of getting out of Egypt. And here we have the son's names, Gershom, referring to somebody being driven out, and Eleazar, meaning God is help. And we also learn in this passage, um, we're reminded up in verse 1, that Jethro is the priest of Midian. And we don't know too much about that at this point, but it seems as if Jethro is serving the one true God in some capacity. He doesn't seem to be a pagan priest, at least from what we learn here. And that's interesting. It's almost like the reference to Melchizedek. If you remember that when we studied the book of Exodus, also mentioned in Hebrews, Melchizedek was a priest, uh, but he was serving God outside and certainly hundreds of years before the law of Moses. And this seems to be perhaps what's going on here uh, with uh, Moses' father Jethro as well. So let's continue tonight then with Exodus chapter 18, verses 5 through 8. The next paragraph, Exodus chapter 18, verses 5 through 8. 
Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was camped at the Mount of God. He sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Then Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and he bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had befallen them on the journey and how the Lord had delivered them. In verses 5 and 6, we find that as Jethro approaches, he sends a messenger on ahead, uh, giving Moses a heads up. So I am coming to see you. I am bringing your wife and sons along with me. But I, I don't know if this is a translation issue, but uh, I believe here it said, I'm bringing your wife and her two sons with her. And that's interesting. Not your two sons, but her two sons. So maybe it had been a little while. And obviously it had been. And so he gives uh, Moses a heads up. Maybe he's treating Moses by the golden rule here, even though the golden rule wouldn't be spoken by Jesus until many years later. You know, but as a leader, Jethro is treating Moses just as he himself would like to be treated uh, by giving him this heads up that he's coming with his wife and these two sons. Uh, through the years, I have learned that elders really don't like surprises. I remember hearing that a number of years ago, and I, I think through the, the years I've come to appreciate that. Uh, if you want to try something new at church, it's usually best to kind of give the, the elders a heads up, warn them, <laughs> uh, give them a chance to mull it over a little bit. They don't always move very quickly. And again, elders usually don't like surprises. And I'm thinking maybe that's something that uh, Jethro, as a leader himself, as a priest of Midian, is probably uh, doing for Moses as he would like to have done for himself. And then also think about this from a security point of view. If you're Moses, you know, you probably don't want people running up to you in the desert unannounced. Uh, years ago, I remember a comedian saying something along these lines, that a, that a good gift for the president would be a chocolate revolver. Uh, but since he's busy, you probably need to run up real quick and give it to him. You know, that, that doesn't end well, does it? So not a good plan. And I'm kind of thinking here, so also with Moses, he wants some heads up if uh, somebody's going to come meet him in the wilderness. Uh, the other part of this is that Jethro is bringing Mrs. Moses or Zipporah and the kids. And I, I would say uh, Moses probably would appreciate some time to kind of prepare for this emotionally. I'm kind of thinking back to Jacob coming home and sending those gifts on ahead to Esau, kind of softening him up. So maybe Jethro may be giving his uh, son-in-law some time to soften. So this isn't kind of a total shock when he just shows up with his uh, wife. Well, in verse 7, when he arrives, Moses bows down before his father-in-law. Um, you fathers-in-law out there are probably kind of, yeah, that kind of sounds like a good plan right here. But very respectful greeting to his father-in-law. He kisses him. Uh, they talk about each other's welfare. So there are some back and forth going on here. And then they head into the tent. They catch up. They talk for a while. Um, now, as we look at this paragraph, it's just a tiny bit weird that we have no real record of what happens between Moses and Zipporah. Isn't that a little bit strange to you? It's kind of strange to me. I mean, this combined with what happened back in Midian has caused some to assume that Moses had a pretty difficult marriage. And I would tend to agree with that. Um, not all leaders have good marriages. And Moses, I think, would fall in that category. If you're away from your wife for a number of months after having an argument, and uh, the last thing she did was throw your son's foreskin at your feet, and then she and her dad come for a visit. And then you go out and bow down and kiss your father-in-law, but there's no record of you and your wife reconnecting? Uh, that's kind of weird. That, that's a little bit strange, at least for uh, normal married couples. There, there seems to be some clear tension uh, in this family. Well, in this conversation, though, Moses is telling his father-in-law about how God has brought them out of Egypt, how God has brought them safely up to this point in the wilderness. And so, in a sense, as leaders, they're talking shop. They're talking about how things are going with their people. So let's continue then with Exodus 18, verses 9 through 12, the next paragraph. Exodus 18, verses 9 through 12. Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel in delivering them from the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh, and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. 
Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. Jethro then is thrilled over the great things that God has done. And I think it's neat that all the way through this passage, the focus is not on what Moses has done, but the emphasis is on what God has done. And I love that, that uh, it's not, Moses, look at this awesome thing you did. You did this, you did that, and so on. That's not the focus here. But rather, God has delivered them from the Egyptians. God was working through Moses, but God has delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh. And Jethro praises God for this. And uh, we have this statement of praise in verses 10 and 11, praising God as being greater than all the other gods. And that's a, uh, as an act of thanksgiving then, Jethro, recognizing this, offers this sacrifice to God right then and there. He can do that. Uh, because he's a priest. You don't have to be a Levite yet. That's not such a th- that, that that's not a thing. That law hasn't been given as far as we know. And then they sit down with the elders of Israel and they have this great feast together. And I'm, I'm assuming that they ate what had just been sacrificed uh, between them. So let's continue with Exodus 18 verses 13 through 16. Exodus 18 verses 13 through 16. It came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood about Moses from the morning until the evening. Now when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge and all the people stand about you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, it comes to me. And I judge between a man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and his laws. So notice now, after the day of sacrifice, after the feasting, after the party's over, Moses the next morning gets back to work. And I want us to notice here that his work involves judging the people. And this is what he does all day long, every day. He's basically uh, settling disputes or putting out fires, as we might say. You know, people get mad at each other. Maybe somebody hurts somebody else, either on purpose or by accident. And, you know, any number of things might happen in a group of two to three million people camping out in the wilderness. And Moses, by default, is just the guy. He's the one who has to deal with all of this. And meanwhile, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, he didn't just come and, and drop off his daughter and leave, but he hangs out for a little bit, and he's standing by, and he's observing this. And as he does, he almost, to me, seems a little bit shocked. You know, it's quite the scene, isn't it? You've got thousands of people standing around waiting for Moses to decide on stuff. And this goes on from morning until evening, and apparently this is the, the tradition. This goes on day after day. And so it's interesting that Jethro, he's not accusatory. He doesn't say, this is a terrible thing. But I find it interesting that he asked the question, and he asked it in a non-threatening way, not, not accusing Moses of anything. But what are you doing? You know, what is this? What's going on here? And Moses explains, well, they want to know what God thinks about this or that. And I also take care of these disputes. I judge between them. And then I explain God's laws. And this is what I do. That This is my job. This is what I do all day long, every day. So before we move on from this, I mean, obviously, this is a problem. We're going to come to a good solution here. But before we move on from this, I just want us to notice that Moses is explaining God's statutes and laws before we actually have the law of Moses? Have we caught that? Have we thought about that? The Ten Commandments don't come until Exodus chapter 20. Right now, we're in Exodus chapter 18. So the law law, the law of Moses, hasn't really been given yet. It hasn't been proclaimed from Mount Sinai. And, you know, you think about that, and some people may have a problem with this. Uh, Some of you may remember we had a guy here in Madison a number of years back who insisted that even today, people outside of Christ will be judged by the law of Moses. That people today are not under the law of Christ, they're under the law of Moses. And um, all the way up until they become Christians. And and it was a, a complex thing that he was teaching, that's the gist of it. But part of his argument in supporting that theory that he had was that there was no law before the law of Moses. That was something that he, was, that he said a number of times. There was no law before the law of Moses. But I want us to notice here that this verse, this passage here, teaches otherwise, doesn't it? As I understand it, people have always had some kind of law from God to follow. 
Think back all the way to the Garden of Eden. They had commandments, in a sense, didn't they? They were commanded to name the animals. That was a job that was given to Moses. You know, this is something you must do. Uh, I remember, believe, I believe I remember they were commanded to care for the garden, weren't they? They were kind of stewards, so this is your job. I am assigning you responsibility. That is a command, in a sense. Uh, they were commanded to be fruitful and multiply, weren't they? They were told to have babies. That This is an order from headquarters. This is what God says you need to be doing. Um, they were forbidden from eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and so on. And so there, there were laws. Uh, there were rules to follow. There were commandments, uh, however you want to label those. And so that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Well, how did they do um, following God's law? They blew it, didn't they? You know, they did the one thing they were told not to do in the Garden and got in trouble for it and kicked out and so on. That was because God told them not to do something and they did it. They broke the law of God in a sense. And then when we studied Genesis uh, a while back, we also learned that Abraham was chosen by God, at least in part, because Abraham followed God's law. And it's very easy to overlook a passage like that. But according to Exodus 26, verse 5, God chose Abraham and he blessed him because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And I don't even remember that passage from when I was little. This is something I discovered later in life. I didn't really think about it, that there were laws from God. There were statutes from God even before the law of Moses. So there were statutes, commandments, laws, even before the Ten Commandments were ever given. And I'm just saying that this passage in Exodus continues to prove that, that two chapters before the Ten Commandments were even given, Moses explains that he is in the habit of explaining God's laws to the people. So let's continue then with Exodus 18, verses 17 through 23. Exodus 18, verses 17 through 23. Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you are doing is not good. You will surely wear out, both yourself and these people who are with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You be the people's representative before God, and you bring the disputes to God, then teach them the statutes and the laws, and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they are to do. Furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place these over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Let them judge the people at all times, and let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their place in peace. All right, so once Jethro truly understands what's going on here, he doesn't jump the gun, he doesn't jump into this quickly, but he notices, as we pointed out earlier, he observes, then he asks a question. And then once he hears Moses' response, he processes this, and he gives Moses some advice. This is not good. The, the problem, cause, solution. That's like one outline I remember we learned for like a, a public speech or a sermon. There, there is a problem, this is what's causing the problem, and this is the solution. I'm just thinking right now, it kind of seems almost like what Jethro is doing. So this is not good, this is the problem. You're going to wear yourself out. But not only are you wearing yourself out, you know, you can't just say, oh, I can take it, this is part of the job, and I'm a tough, uh, no. You're also wearing the people out due to those long lines and the waiting for justice. Can you imagine if our Supreme Court here in the United States heard every single case, if they were the only court, there would be no justice at all. There would be no chance of justice. They could never hear everything. So this job, Jethro is saying, it's too much for any one person. You can't do this alone. And personally, I think he's probably also looking out for his daughter and his grandsons a little bit here. That's just me inserting that in here doesn't say exactly why but the situation between Moses and Zipporah Jethro's daughter it will never get better if Moses never has any time to even be at home and so if I want my daughter to have a chance of moving forward in this relationship if I want this thing to be fixed 
we got to get Moses away from these, you know, 80, 90 hour work week type situations. So Jethro has some advice. What you need to do is you be the people's representative before God. That's not changing. That's what you've been, been doing. But you need to focus on teaching the statutes and the laws. That, that really needs to be your main primary focus. And you need to explain how to apply those laws so the people can solve some of those issues themselves. I mean, so there at the beginning, just communicating effectively may solve a lot of this beforehand. And we've learned that in life, haven't we? If you're a school teacher, getting the, the rules, this is, these are the expectations of the class at Bible camp. We got the list of rules. And there's reasons for all of those. And if we don't communicate those clearly, it's just going to be chaos through the week. So first of all, focus on educating the people according to the law of God. But notice the second part of this is that Moses needs to delegate. I think that's what we would say. I think that's an accurate summary. You need to delegate much of what you've been doing. And so Jethro then explains, Moses, you need to go find some qualified men. And he gives some, some qualifications here. And these are awesome qualifications for judges today, aren't they? You know, men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain. It almost sounds like uh, the qualifications for elders. Some of those are repeated over in Timothy and Titus. So basically, you need to find some qualified men, follow the qualifications. Not just anybody can do this. And then you need to establish some structure to your judicial system. You know, divide the people by thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. And have the people solve a vast majority of their issues further on down the line so it never gets to you. And then Moses, you only need to get involved on the big cases when something can't be solved at one of those lower levels. So if the people know the law, if they know how to apply it themselves, and if they have help down the line, then they should be able to deal with a lot of that stuff without Moses ever getting involved. And that'll make life easier for Moses. And it's not like Moses needs to do this so he can lounge around all day. This is not the goal here. Moses has some other things to deal with, doesn't he? He's leading the nation. And so Moses will then be able to put his focus on leading the nation as a whole instead of dealing with, you know, who did what to who and when and, and so on. So the benefit then will be twofold. Moses will be able to endure, but then also the people will be able to live in peace. So there's a the benefit goes both ways here. Nobody loses in this situation. So let's conclude tonight. This is Exodus 18, verses 24 through 27. Exodus 18, 24 through 27. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. They judged the people at all times, the difficult dispute they would bring to Moses, but every minor dispute they themselves would judge. Then Moses bade his father-in-law farewell, and he went his way into his own land. And so the conclusion here is that Moses listens to his father-in-law. He's got some good advice, and so he listens to this. He delegates, and then they execute the plan. And they bring the difficult cases to Moses, but a vast majority of those issues they deal with at those lower levels. And then Jethro goes ahead and goes on home. So that brings us to the end of Exodus 18. I think we've learned a lesson on sharing the burden of leadership. And, you know, that's just a general principle, not just in the church, but in life in general, that we, we can apply to a workplace, we can apply that to our families, the neighborhoods, and so on. And, and I think tonight we've seen the value of not trying to do everything ourselves, because we can't. Uh, we're human. And I think we've also learned something about the value of listening to advice, haven't we? I think that's kind of a uh, under-the-surface type lesson here. It would have been so easy for Moses to reject this advice. You know, I just led two to three million people out of Egypt. Who do you think you are coming in here and observing for a couple hours and telling me what to do? I mean, that would have been a very easy response for a leader to have. But I want us to notice that instead of that, Moses thinks about it. And he puts this plan in motion, and it ends up being good both for Moses and the people that he's leading. So thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions, any concerns, or comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about to our members, if you have an update to the bulletin, uh, let me know right away. I'd appreciate it. Get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give a call to me at 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us this written word, this record of what happened as your people passed through the wilderness many years ago. Tonight we're thankful for Moses, and tonight we're especially thankful for what we've learned from Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. We also pray for opportunities to help and to serve. We pray for opportunities to share the burden of leadership with those who are leading the congregation. And tonight we're thankful for your law and for your statutes. We know that you've always had instruction for us as human beings because you created us, you know what's best for us, and you love us. And Father, we pray that we would love and respect your word, that we would live by it. We come to you tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus, our lawgiver and our judge. Amen.